All right, this is going to be a Thanksgiving sermon as such. Thank God for thanking God. Whenever we preach on being thankful, whether it's at Thanksgiving time or any other, I know that some people, especially new Christians and probably children, wonder why we make so much or the Bible makes so much out of thanking God. Does God really insist on all of this gratitude? Is he a stern and forbidding God who sits up there in the heavens and looks down upon his people and says, well, now look, you thank me for this and you thank me for that or else. And um, children do see their parents thanking God for their food and for other things. They grow up that way, and I know they reach a point where they feel that God has blessed them and these things do come from God and so on. But the question I want to discuss today is, does God do this just because he gets something out of it? Does God desire or require our praise and our gratitude in order to make him feel good? Is that the reason for all of this? Let's go back to the first command in Exodus 20, and we'll begin reading there. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them, for I... For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So he is saying, I am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, and by implication it is that if you bow down, give worship or thanks to some other God, then God will punish you for doing that. Now, that's rather plainly stated in the first part of that. He says, you shall bow down to me, you shall serve me, I am a jealous God, I demand love and gratitude or else. And that's just about the way it sounds. Now, he prefaced the uh, Ten Commandments and all of this law covenant with this or these two phrases, verse 2 and 3, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And you remember those phrases while I ask, if you remember, what was Israel's first sin? What was Israel's first sin? Well, some of you remember, of course, it was worshiping a golden calf. Turn over to Exodus 24, in verse 12. And the Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me into the mount, and be there, and I will give thee tables of stone, and a law, and commandments which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. Verse 18, And Moses went up into the midst of the cloud, and gat him up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount forty days and forty nights. Chapter 25. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly. With his heart he shall take my offering. And then he gives the offerings that they should give for the purpose of building the tabernacle. And he tells Moses how to build the tabernacle and how to make all the priest's garments and what they were to do and the offerings they were to give and so on. And, of course, this took, apparently, this... 40 days, ending in verse 18 of Exodus 31, and he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. But let's read right on. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron, and said unto him, Up! Make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. About seven or eight weeks had passed, 
And they said, We need a god, so you make one for us. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand, and fashioned it with a graving tool, after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, This be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. So the first thing they attributed to this God was that it was this God that had brought them up out of the land of Egypt. And, of course, uh, we know that they then, in effect, worshipped it. And God uh, then told Moses in verse 7, The Lord said unto Moses, Go get thee down, for thy people which thou broughtest up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf, and have worshipped it, and have sacrificed thereunto, and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. So here is that God who sits up in the heavens and demands gratitude and already told them they were not to worship anyone else, that it was he, God Almighty, who brought them out of Egypt. They turned around and they gave credence to another God and gratitude to a molten idol for bringing them out of Egypt. And God says, all right, I'll destroy them. So this does sound like a God who demands gratitude or else, doesn't it? He's already indicated here. Well, of course, we know that Moses interceded for Israel and told God that these were the Israel people and reminded him that he had a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then God changed his mind and sent Moses back down there. And you know the rest of the story. So... It was God who brought Israel out of Egypt. It was God who told Israel he did that, and he told them they were to worship him. He prefaced the Ten Commandments with, I brought you out of Egypt, therefore, and on and on and on. So he does sound like the kind of a God who's waiting for praise and gratitude or else. He almost destroyed Israel when they gave praise and gratitude to another God for something that God had done. Let's go all the way over to the New Testament now. We know that the early Christians were praising and thanking people. And in the epistles, of course, is the foundation for that, because over and over they're told that they should thank God for this and that and so on. We'll read a few, and then I am going to show you a more excellent reason why God demands thanks from us rather than that it is something that he himself desires for his benefit. Romans 1 and verse 8, Paul writes, First I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. So he believed God was responsible for their faith, and he thanked God for it. Romans 14 and verse 6, he that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. So the man who eats or the man who fasts gives God thanks in both cases, right? In one case he has food, in one case he doesn't. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 24. This is at the... Last Supper in Jesus, when he get given thanks, he break it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. So Jesus Christ established the ordinance of communion, of thanks for bread and thanks for his body, thanks for the sacrifice which he was to give and then did give. Second Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14 now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the Savior of his knowledge by us in every place. And Paul uses this 
Same phrase about four or five times in this one letter, thanks be unto God, and then he gives something that happened or that would happen and implies that he is giving thanks and they should to God for what had happened. In the letter to the Ephesians in chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. So he thanked God for other Christians. In the fifth chapter of that letter, starting in verse 1, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us in offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. So he says, don't do all of these sinful things, but instead give thanks. Verse 14 through verse 20, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's analyze those just a little. Several positive things commanded there in verse 14. Christ will give thee light. Verse 15, walk circumspectly or honestly. 16, redeem the time. 17, understand God's will. 18, be filled with the Spirit. 19, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And verse 20, giving thanks always for all things unto God. Now let's read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14 through 22. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men, see that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men, rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So that should be enough to prove to you that it is Christian to give thanks to God, and it obviously was commanded in the Old Testament, even in the Ten Commandments, with supposedly dire consequences coming upon those who did not give thanks unto God. And in these verses, in effect, Paul said, giving thanks always, and in everything give thanks. Now I want to read part of the dictionary meaning of this word thank or thanks, and then try and see how this is actually related to God, and then we'll discuss that reason why we should give him thanks, not the reason that he demands it for himself, but for a greater reason. This is from Webster's Complete Dictionary, and I won't quote all of this, but uh, number one uh, for the word thanks, it is thought or inquiry, because this can be an asking also. Two, kindly or grateful thought, gratitude, also grace, favor, as give thanks to God. Number three, an expression of gratitude, an acknowledgment, as by words for a favor or kindness received. And then it gives several examples. And I think whenever we think of thanking, we think in terms of for a favor or kindness received. But Webster goes on. To express gratitude or make acknowledgments to one for a favor or kindness, 
sometimes, ironically, to hold responsible to consider one to blame. Now, you've all used that. Perhaps you hadn't thought about it. You say, well, he has himself to thank when he's in trouble, right? I can thank so-and-so for the fact my car is wrecked. You see, the word has a negative meaning also, which we hardly ever think about. And that may be why Paul was so adamant about making the Christian people understand they were to always give thanks, and they were to give thanks for all things. They were to thank God for the good things, and according to Webster, and I believe this is in the meaning of this, to acknowledge that God might also be the cause of things that we might not like. That it was God that had done such and so, and we were to thank God for that also, and I think that's what he meant. Now let's go back to that Ephesians 5 and verse 20 again, where he said, "...giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, does this have a little different meaning to you? Do you understand we are reading a book which is written about a God who is responsible for all things, not just what you think might be good things that come to you. And sometimes our tendency is to thank God only when something good happens to us. Now, let's read on in the epistles. Turn on over to... 1 Peter, chapter 1, starting in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season. And notice he's talked about all the great and wonderful things, your future resurrection to life everlasting, your reward that's reserved in heaven, and so on. But he goes right on. Though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So here he's talking about manifold temptations and a trial, being much more precious than of gold. Now I think almost every Christian, if God were to deposit a gold bar, on his front step some morning, and he found it there and could buy all sorts of things for himself, he would thank God for it, wouldn't he? If he knew it came from God, he'd thank him for it. Peter says there is something coming from God here of the trial of your faith, which is more precious than gold that perisheth. Did you know that a trial was something you might want to thank God for? Turn to uh, chapter 4, starting in verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the Spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. What would you do if you received trouble, tribulation, accusations, perhaps even some physical punishment that would come up on you because you were a Christian? Would you thank God for it? Would you put the blame, and that word isn't a negative word, by the way. You know, we sometimes get the blame for things which we do that turn out very good for people, and we take the blame for it, don't we? Would you give God your thanks and gratitude that He allowed you to receive punishment because you were a Christian? 
That's what Peter is writing about here. That this is something also which comes from God. So you are to do what? Well, thank God for it. Turn back to the letter to the Romans again. In chapter 5, verses 3 through 5. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. So here you have something happening that begins with tribulation, then patience, experience, hope, and then you're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So perhaps some of us need tribulation in order to bring us to a position where we really are thankful unto God. From our first example, go all the way back to Exodus again, where God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Then he implied that Israel would have great trouble from God if they gave their gratitude and thanks to someone else. They did within a matter of weeks. God spoke to Moses with a threat or a warning that he would destroy Israel for having given that thanks to someone else. Now, I want to ask you a question here in relation to what God said to Moses in Exodus 32. In verse 8, he said to Moses, They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf, and have worshipped it, and have sacrificed thereunto, and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt, and then he said he would destroy them until Moses said, You have a covenant with these people. You must keep your covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But why was God so angry? I think the key is given in verse 7 where he said to Moses, Thy people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. Now you stop and think for a moment what happens and what is happening to God's Israel people when they leave off thanking God for all things and always for everything. What happens? They fall into sin and corruption. They are destroyed. They have ill health. They die at a young age. Their country is taken captive and they are destroyed. When they do what? Leave off crediting God for all things. Now you think on this because we have a nation which because it has ceased to give thanks to God Almighty for all things has lost its knowledge that God is the creator, the lawgiver, the sustainer, the protector, and the deliverer of Israel. They don't know that. So what do they do? They turn to government, they turn to false prophets, they turn to all sorts of isms seeking the thing that will bring good to them and what comes upon them, evil. Now don't you think God knew that? That if Israel turned away from thanking God, it was Israel who would be hurt. That is why God was so serious and so contentious, if you please, to tell Israel, you give me the thanks. You give me the credit for all things. And what would happen? Israel would stay in line with God's Word. Israel would read God's Word. Israel would see where good came from. Israel would see that when they disobeyed, punishment and judgment came upon them. Instead, when they turn away from giving credit to God for being God... All sorts of evil and wickedness comes upon Israel, and we can see it, of course, in our nation today. Is God benefited by Israel giving thanks? No, it is Israel. It is Israel that is benefited by the thanks being given unto God. Now, I'm going to state a few premises here on this, and you see if it doesn't make sense. Quite a few parents write to me, after their children are grown and they come into the knowledge 
of Jesus Christ and the kingdom message, and they say, how can I reach my children? I want my children to know about the Bible, and I'm trying to tell them the truth, and so on. Well, had you ever thought of what happens with children growing up in a home where the parents do continually thank God for all things? You know what happens? They're believing children every day from the time they were small until they became adults. They saw that their parents gave credit to God for good things and for trouble. Thank God for tribulation. Thank God for the frailties of the flesh. And the children saw this, and the children knew what? That there is a God, that Jesus Christ is God. They learned that by listening to parents thanking God for everything. If they were to do that, they wouldn't have to write to some pastor when they're 40 or 50 years old and say, how in the world am I going to reach my teenagers or my young children with the knowledge of the Bible? If they'd thank God at home, the children would have grown up in a home knowing that God is God. What about a person who is fearful and afraid of poverty or disease or a breakup of a marriage or something like that? If they even live around and associate with people who continually thank God, that happens to them just like it happens to the children. A peace and an understanding and a faith comes upon them. Because every time you thank God for anything in the presence of other people, you're doing what? You're preaching a little sermon, aren't you? You're telling them, I believe God is responsible for what we're talking about right here today. How about enjoyment? This is one thing that really struck me, and I believe it has many of our people. Most of the people who come into the knowledge of the kingdom message and that we are the Israel people love this nation of America. Some of them have traveled to some extent around the country and they think it's beautiful and it's great and so on, as we did. But the enjoyment you had of this great and beautiful nation before you knew this nation was a gift from God does not compare to what you now see out there, does it? And I've had people write and tell me this and they drive across country and they see a great portion of this wonderful God-blessed land, and they say, I certainly enjoy my vacations more now after I realize America is a gift from God to our people, to us, to me. Everything that you receive gives you much greater enjoyment if you know it came from God and you thank Him for it. That's everything your home, your family, your children, your car, your job, whatever. You enjoy it more. Now, does God enjoy it more because you thank Him? No. God commanded you to thank Him because He knew it would increase your blessings from Him. That's the reason God did this. Not because He's an ogre who sits up there in heaven with a whip ready to snap you with it if you don't thank God for your meal. Your food tastes better. Everything that happens to you is better. What about our enemies? We know of many people, and I know some of you people went the same route, where you learned all about the communists and the enemies of America and their power and how they've infiltrated this nation under the guise of being liberals or being Democrats or being Republicans or being something else, and they're actually our enemies. And you find all of this out and it brings a great fear and a great terror on you until you come to a point where you thank God for the nation and for everything that's happening and realize that the judgment and the tribulation upon us is for one thing, to correct us, to turn us around, to set us aright, to get us back to God's Word. And then what do we say? Thank God for the enemies that are bringing tribulation upon the United States of America. And you know what does it do? It takes a great load off from you when you realize it is God who is to blame for the power that resides in communist Russia. How about that? It is God who has given them all of the military and all of the missiles. It is God who has given them 
the power to come against this country and to come against other countries of the world. And you know what that does? When you thank God for that, you know if he gave them the power, he can take it away just like that. You see, if you do not thank God for everything, then everything depends upon you and you and everyone else in their physical and mental powers, right? And then there's no hope. But once you realize, as Webster said when he wrote that word about thank, ironically giving someone the blame for something that's happening, then you know what Paul and Peter and the rest of these meant. Thank God for everything. It is God who is responsible. It is God who has the power. It is God who will take care. And then I think you thank God for everything. Let's close in John 19. Because we're talking about the Jesus Christ who said that all power was given unto him in heaven and in earth, but before that he came under the power of men. In John 19 he was before Pilate, and we read this in verse 10, Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and have power to release thee? Here's a man saying to God, Don't you know I've got power to put you to death or to release you? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. God is sovereign. It is Jesus who has all power in heaven and in earth. And I know of no greater way to set that firmly in your hearts and minds and to set it firmly in the hearts and minds of your children and your family than to thank God always for all things. And then you really will thank God for thanking God. Let's stand. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this word that gives us wisdom and understanding. And Lord God, we pray that you'll see it deep in our hearts and minds that thou art God Almighty and all power is in thy hands. And we know that you are a great and wonderful and merciful God. You have bought us for a price. You have shed your blood. You have redeemed us under thy kingdom. And we know as certainly as we stand here today that that time shall come when we shall be with you in thy kingdom because thou hast the power. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.